Why is it important to Matthew that he actually tells us where this happened? Where did this happen today, the story? When Jesus entered the district of Caesarea Philippi. How many of you know where Caesarea Philippi is? Oh, there's two of us. Good. It's north of Tyron in Sidon. If you follow the map, actually there's probably, you can find a map in the back of your Bible. If there's not one in the back of your Bible, um, email me. I can probably point you to one online um, someplace. Um, but you can follow the trek that Jesus took over the past couple of weeks. He's gone quite a, a, a good distance over the past couple of weeks. But Matthew makes the point of telling us that this happened in Caesarea Philippi. You see, Luke didn't. In Luke's version of this story, he doesn't tell us where it happened. He drops the Caesarea Philippi. So for some reason, this has to be important to Matthew. The location that this occurs in somehow plays into this story. But before we get to that, what actually happened in our story this morning? Jesus asked them, who do people say that I am? They said, John, Jeremiah, some of the prophets, Ezekiel, we're not quite sure who you are. People don't know quite sure. Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter who sometimes is the bumbling idiot of the disciples, steps forward and makes a profession of faith. And where does this profession of faith come from? Does it come from Peter? No. God, Jesus says that it comes from God. But Peter steps up and makes a pronouncement that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Je Jesus responds to him saying, You are right. Peter, bar Jonah. Right? Peter, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood did not give you this answer, but our Heavenly Father opened up inside of you this answer. And so I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. Right? This is the setting up of Peter as Pope. Right? Peter, for the Catholics, Peter is the predecessor to the Pope, correct? Correct? Yeah, I got, I got my couple Catholics in the audience going, yes. Yes. Okay. So just as long as we're not giving any bad theology here, that's what we want to make sure we're not doing here. Peter is the setup as the predecessor for the Pope in the Catholic Church. because One of the reasons is because of this verse. There are many other reasons. But this verse, because Peter is given the keys to the kingdom. And Jesus gives the keys of the kingdom specifically to Peter in this verse. And he says, upon this rock I will build my church. Right? Peter is, Peter's name in Greek is Cephas and Cephas, or Petra. And Petra is... A Christian rock band. No. Yes. <laughs> Let's see how many of you know that. Right. It is. But Petra also means rock. So upon this rock, I will build my church. So Jesus has now given Peter the keys to the kingdom. And he says upon this rock, meaning Peter, Petra, I build my church. The reason that Peter is the predecessor for the Pope in the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church is built upon the understanding that the Pope is the head of the Church. Right? There's one little problem to all of this theology, though. A little bit later in Matthew, in chapter 18, verse 18, Jesus turns to the Ecclesia. What does Ecclesia mean in Greek? You guys are going to be Greek scholars by the time we get done here this morning. Ecclesia means gathering, or body, or church. He's talking to not only the disciples, but a whole multitude of people, and He says, I give to you... The ability, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven and whatever is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. What is that? It's the keys to the kingdom. So not only in Matthew did he give them to Peter, but he also then turned around a few, verse, a few chapters later and gave them to everybody. So is Peter the rock on which the church is built? Or is he talking about where Matthew said they were at? Caesarea Philippi. Does rock mean Peter? Or does rock mean the place where Jesus was standing? It could be both. And I won't say that it's not both. But it brings us back to Caesarea Philippi, right? Caesarea Philippi, according to Eugene Boring, 
who wrote in the New Interpreter's Bible on Matthew. Caesarea Philippi is about 20 miles north of the Sea of Galilee, had earlier been the site of a ball cultic center, then in Hellenistic times became known as a Panias, as Panias, Panias, became known as Panias because the god Pan had been worshipped in the famous grotto and springs there, but was renamed by Herod the Great after he built there a temple to Caesar Augustus. After Herod's death, it was part of the territory of his son Philip, who enlarged the town and named it after Tiberius Caesar and himself. During the war of, of 66 through 70, Caesarea was a recreation spot for the Roman general Vespian, who began the siege of Jerusalem and then left his son Titus in charge to complete it when he became emperor. After the fall of Jerusalem, Titus and his troops returned to Caesarea, where Josephus reports he had some of the Jewish captives thrown to wild animals. Matthew's preservation of this location, dropped by Luke, may only be incidental. But since he did omit Mark's setting on the road, Matthew may have wished to emphasize that a significant scene took place in a setting with older nationalistic and religious associations, Jewish and pagan. He brings the scene of Jesus' confession as the Jewish Messiah into the shadow of a Caesar temple where the Roman destroyers of Jerusalem had celebrated their victory, a revered site long associated with both pagan and Jewish revelatory events. Caesarea Philippi was a site of pagan worship. It was the site of a place where the Romans threw Jewish prisoners to wild animals. It's a place completely disassociated what Jesus Christ is here to do. So if Jesus is saying upon this rock right here, where I'm standing, I'm going to build my church, at the place where the pagan gods are worshipped, at the place that we believed, actually, it's not in this description, but Caesarea Philippi, when, when it was Panius, was believed it was a location of the gates of hell. The grottos that it talked about when Boring talked about it in his description, those grottos were considered to be the gates of hell. Jesus is saying in this specific geographical location where Baal was worshipped, Pan was worshipped, where pagan gods were worshipped and were atrocious things done to the Jewish people was done. Upon this place right here, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to bring the light of God and the love of God into the midst of this darkness and hatred and build my church right here. And not even the gates of hell are going to withstand it. So was the rock that Jesus was building his church on Peter or was it this pagan idol-worshipping spot where he was standing? Confessing Jesus as Messiah is real easy when we're standing in here. If I asked each of you right now, is Jesus the Messiah, you'd probably easily say yes. When you're in school and someone does something to you that you have to stand up against and you have to say you're doing this because of who your God is, is it easy to say that? Or when you're in work and you see somebody doing something that they shouldn't be doing and you tell them you shouldn't be doing that because our faith doesn't call for that, is that easy to do? It's easy to confess our faith here, but what if we went out in front of a gentleman's club or a New Age temple or Mormon temple in Salt Lake City or the local state or federal government buildings? I just talked about our places of work and school. Is that easy? No, it's not. Most of us will cower away from it and we won't even talk about our faith. So how is it that we can help you confess your faith at work, at school, in the mall, in the many other places that we're confronted by signs and symbols of other gods, materialism, greed, things that pull us away from God. It's the way we live that Paul talked to the Romans, that I talked to the kids and the teachers up here. This is your spiritual sacrifice, your living sacrifice, your spiritual worship, that you're not conformed to this world but you're conformed to the love that God has given to you. And you live out that calling in your daily lives. That passage in Romans talks about how the body is knit together and we're each a part of that body and each of us has something to do and we each have the ability to go into the world and to speak the love that God has given to us. God has called us to go and to do those things. And we have to remember that to Matthew, confessing one's faith is more about deeds than it is about words. The famous quote from St. Francis of Assisi that he never actually said. 
It is actually true. St. Francis of Assisi never said this. He said something like it, but it still gets attributed to him. Speak the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. To Matthew, it's not about speaking our faith out loud, which is really hard for us to do. To Matthew, it's about living out the fruit of the Spirit and doing the deeds that show forth God's love. So it's sitting with a kid that has no one to sit with them, or picking up the books of someone that just got them knocked out of their hands by somebody, or talking to the person at work that no one else will talk to. Doing the things that God calls us to do because that's who we're supposed to be in the world. And if we can do that, if we can live out our faith, showing forth the things that we've been given to do, living out that spiritual sacrifice, then that spot where Jesus built His church on that pagan idol worship, we'll see Jesus' church sprouting up in the mall, in our places of work, in our schools, everywhere around us. Because not only will this safe place be a haven where we can proclaim Jesus as Messiah, but if each and every one of us live out our faith in action, then this world will become a safe haven for us to confess our faith and to live out our lives that God has called us to do and to be. And each and every one of us then can do as Peter did and say, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And in you I trust. And I want to give that to everybody else in the world to show them just how much you mean to me and how much you can mean to them. Because believing in Jesus will move us to show the world just exactly how much he means to us and how our life is different because of the fact that Jesus is a part of our lives and fills us and moves us to go into the world to show forth his love. So go out into the world filled with the Holy Spirit into the places of pagan worship into the places of idol worship, into the places where other authorities seem to rule and govern and take away God's presence, allowing the Holy Spirit to fill you and move you as it did Peter, to give you the words to speak and the actions to do, to make your living Savior and Lord known to all the world. Let your life so speak the gospel and the difference of believing in Jesus as your Savior. So go and preach the gospel at all times through the actions of your lives. And if you have to, open your mouth and tell them about Jesus as well.